Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Unlocked Show. I'm your host, Tracy Wilson. You guys are in for an absolute treat today with my very special guest. And, you know, normally I have guests from all over the world, but sometimes it's just really, really lovely to have somebody who's actually just from up the road. The amazing Wendy Nash is here to join me today, and we're going to be talking about the perils of positive thinking. Now, if you're anything like me, I grew up... Wendy may even tell you some of these stories of her childhood and her upbringing, but I certainly grew up in a world where we were t- we were taught to be positive. You know, people love positive people. You get a you know you attract other like minded people if you are positive. There are so many sayings around you know why you should be positive, why you should empower yourself to have a level of positive thinking. And we're going to talk about, well, the perils of positive thinking today. So Wendy is actually a somatic psychotherapist. She has been working in this field for, I'm going to say, a number of years. She's got a a bachelor's degree of, let me just make sure that I get this absolutely right, a bachelor of psychology and honors. And she also has been working through the, uh, the work of loving kindness meditation and pro-social behavior. So I want to share with you guys how, you know, well, we're going to share with you how she's been working with a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of business owners to really get in touch with, I suppose, thinking, looking and uh, working on their internal state of mind. And how do we do that so that we can kind of combat some of these, uh, you know, perils of positive thinking. So welcome to the show, Wendy. It's fantastic to have you here. Love the fact that you are literally, I mean, when I say down the road, I mean, she's like an hour up the road from me. Um, so, you know, you just never know, we might be able to catch up in person at some at some point. But welcome to the show. Great to have you here. So tell me a little bit about how this is all, you know, how this has all come about. I know you've got like a vast sort of background and, um, you know, experiences that you've gone through over the last kind of 20 or 30 years, and even your upbringing has brought you to where you are today. So I'm going to let you share, um, you know, and the nutshell version of how you've come to be doing what you're doing today. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Before I start, I do like to acknowledge that where we've come from sort of determines where we're going and that I am calling from Gubby Gubby country, which is the Aboriginal country mm-hmm. that comes, that is basically where we are. Well, where I am, you're in a different country, I think probably, mm-hmm. but so I do like to always acknowledge the elders past and present. I think it's really important Thank to you. just know where we've come from and it's, we, we come with stuff and, and that's what takes us into the future. I also wanted to say thank you very much for letting me uh, be on your show. I'm a bit intimidated by the live experience, so I'm sorry if I sound a little bit nervous. That's totally okay. And don't be, I can tell you, all the viewers are going to say, hey, Wendy, you know, we love you and and um, yeah, they're, a, they're a whole lot of fun. So don't feel nervous by that at all. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to do a little correction. I did train as a somatic psychotherapist. It's a four-year training and it was mm-hmm. phenomenally useful. But I, I actually work as a coach, as a meditation coach, mm. just because it's a, an insurance thing. I don't I don't work psychotherapeutically. So I just wanted to, to clarify that one. Uh, but you. it's very, very much informs my practice because it really helps me understand people at a much deeper level than rather stick to the very surface stuff. So I guess you wanted me to talk about how I got to here. Um, Mm. So I was raised with positive thinking. My mum's a real positive thinking kind of person. And I think post-war, it was really important. People were absolutely devastated from the, you know, not only the Second World War, but the First World War. And it was absolutely horrific. And the only way people could really get through all that was to say, let's look for the positives. And I think Mm. that when people have very difficult, you know, when the whole culture is like that, you've just got to find your way. And I think that that time sort of the baby boomers raised with that, I think think it was a really important contribution because you don't want to be stuck in the mire and the darkness all the time. You do want to look for the positives. Um, But as it happens, both my sister and my father died when I was a child. And to always be like, yes, but you've got to look for the positives. It doesn't allow the emotional space to go, actually, I'm having a really hard time here. So I think our emotions are very shared, like we're, we're human. 
and we kind of come into our own when we are in a shared experience like this. And so if I were to, uh, if you were to say something that was sort of um, was talked about a little bit difficult for you, um, for me to go, oh, well, look for the positives, it's not really allowing you to kind of enter into my, I'm not allowing mm -hmm. you to, to kind of be felt and seen. And so that's where the problem is with the positive thinking. Mm -hmm. I learned that because um, I had, had quite a complex uh early life as I just mentioned and then I went and lived overseas and I was really indoctrinated with the idea of positive thinking but I just didn't know what to do with all this negative stuff and the feelings and the depression and the sorrow so I just decided that I would really focus on actually figuring out who I am and what do I really feel that's what I was really interested in so that's why I did the psychotherapy diploma that's why I did the um uh, the psychology degree and that's why I focused on it is pro-social behavior so it's all about mm -hmm. how to so it was loving kindness meditation and thinking kindly about people which is really important so I was working with a client yesterday and she was and I and we we're talking about finding the good bits so it's what I'm saying is to not negate the good bits and uh, she said, oh, well, I went to work this time yesterday. And I said, well, what does work mean? And she said, oh, well, you know, it's this. And I said, well, how did that arise for you? And she said, well, my mentor um, sort of gave me this list, started this list, and I needed to continue it. And so I said, so does your is your mentor paid? And she said, no, no, she does it. She's, she offers that for free. So that's really looking for the lovely part that's kind, the offers of generosity, mm -hmm. which I think is really important. Like it's mm -hmm. so nice that you have offered to me this space and, and place to uh, share what I know. Um, but it's not, but, but also likewise, she also talked about how it was really difficult that she'd been offered this amazing situation and she just said oh, I got just really nervous and then I started blaming and doubting and if I had just gone oh well look for the positives at least you know this wonderful situation arose it's sort of not really meeting the person and it can't what do you do with those feelings of going well I actually feel a bit doubtful and I feel a bit afraid how am I going to be able to do that and so it's finding balance with it so mm. that, that's yes yeah. and and I can understand why you would say, you know, often when, say, you've got a problem or, like, for example, you've lost, you know, you lost your dad and your, your sister and people say, well, you know, look for a silver lining. I mean, I've just had a recent experience like that. I lost my mum earlier this year, you know, and um, often we can think or we say to ourselves, I know I've certainly done it, you know, okay, well, if I think really positively, you know, mum didn't have to suffer through that. But in truth, and that is true, but on the flip side of that too, there is all this emotion that comes with that, trying to work your way through, well, how do you actually really feel about that? And so therefore, if somebody just said, well, you know, if you find this silver lining in that, you know, that was a positive thing that, you know, your mum passed at that time and she didn't have to suffer. It's almost as if they're dismissing the, the real feelings that you're having and not really, like you say, not really seeing or hearing maybe the underlying messages that are attached to that positive the positivity that goes with so I can I can totally um you know I'm just thinking about some very recent instances where where that has been very very relevant and I know that um you know, we talk about this sort of stuff in our own personal lives, but from a, a point of view of uh, being a business owner, and I know you do a lot of work with entrepreneurs and business owners, which a lot of the, the folk that watch and listen to the show are, that sometimes we can tend to pick up those things and we take them with us because we are the in my opinion, the whole person, you kind of, you don't really have the option of being able to compartmentalize your life. You bring to, whether you want to or not, you bring the whole of you to whatever the situation is. And sometimes those unresolved uh, issues, things that maybe we haven't been so introspective on, tend to show up 
and funny little places that we often least expect. So maybe we can talk a little bit about um, even some of that that we see, you know, from because it, because it's going to happen in both our personal and in our business lives. And I think one of the things that hold a lot of people back is the fact that these things do show up over and over and over again in our professional lives. We don't always recognize them. Yeah, so first off, I just wanted to say I'm sorry to hear that your mum died. And um, it is heartbreaking at some level. You know, no matter how complex our relationships are with with people like our parents. So some people, in your instance, it sounds like you had a really lovely relationship, but that's not the case for everybody. And it can be quite, there's a lot of mixed feelings that can arise, mm. but it sounds like you had a really lovely relationship with your mum and it's it's left a bit of a hole there. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Yeah, it is, um, it's not always easy and there are ups and downs. And in truth, it takes about 18 months for, for the cycle of, the worst part of the grief to pass. So just to give you a bit of a heads up on, it's just going to be a bit of a roller coaster for for quite a while. So I just mm. wanted to to speak to that. And how to include that with work in a work situation? So um, I work with people, and often they get funding rejections. It's quite difficult mm. when you get a funding rejection uh, because it's like, well, am I not good enough? Was I not well prepared? Do they think I'm no good? Do, what sort of things can I have? And, and then how do you then deal with that? And then you've got to then go into your, maybe you've got a pitch coming up straight away. So how are you going to deal with that? And basically what I always say is, so one of the things I've been really looking at in the last couple of days, actually, is to start looking at the emotion of disappointment. So mm. if you think about a business situation, in fact, any argument you've had or any relationship that's kind of been breached, often that's about disappointment. So um, if you, if I'm disappointed that I didn't get my funding rejection, fundamentally, I'm just super disappointed because I was really banking on that money to be able to do X, Y, Z. If you don't recognize that disappointment is part and parcel of the process and you just go, oh, well, I'll just skip over the top of that. That energy is just going to really, um, it's going to sort of permeate, as you said, and kind of leak out. So I'm not saying you have to indulge in disappointment, but just simply to own it. So one of the things that I like to do is to um, to just say, I feel, I feel disappointed. Yes, it's true. I feel disappointed. Leave it mm -hmm. at that. Very, very simple. So it's through acknowledging dis that we are disappointed or sad or hurt or frustrated or joyful or delighted or happy or in love you know like i just it's beautiful to just acknowledge that we have all these wonderful emotions and also that we maybe we feel angry so it doesn't matter what feeling it is but if we just say yes it's true i feel you know, so now at the moment I feel a bit nervous. It's true, I do feel a bit nervous and I can feel a little bit, oh, I get a bit, oh, do I look good and do I sound good and I'm making sense. I've got all that going on. But if I just go, oh, I feel a bit nervous, I go, it's okay, actually. This is the human condition. It's the human experience. And I know that your <laughs> listeners are probably very lovely going, I'm sure it's, I know that feeling. I'll be saying, so, it's okay, Wendy, you're, you're good. We, yeah, you look good, you sound good, we're with you. They'll be absolutely doing that. Exactly, exactly. But if I, if I just said, oh, I'm not nervous, I'm just going to be really chipper and I'm going to be upbeat and I'm going to be, it feels fake. You know, you can really yeah. sense it. So you've got to just own it. And then once you've owned it, it kind of works through the body, comes out the other side. You, there's a, a sort of a, a sensation, a thickness that comes in the body. And then you're kind of, you can then go into your meeting, you pitch and just feel like, well, that was then and that's in the past. And now I'm kind of coming forward with an open heart. It's not blocked mm. or clouded by what is, uh, what I didn't want to own. So I didn't, you know, I like disappointment. If you don't own that, then, well, it might 
it'll kind of seep in there, as you said earlier on. So I'm mm. hoping I've answered your question. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you have. So with, um, you know, trying to get, because this is a real, I'm, I'm going to say there's a bit of an art to this. And the reason I say this is because, and I can put my hand up and say, I'm one of those people that has trouble relaxing, you know, just, and I can remember um, recently, and my husband booking us in to go to something called, we call it the city cave. And it's like a, um, I suppose you call it a soak house. So we went and did this infrared um, experience and then you got to go into this room and you're supposed to get in this pool and, and it's supposed to be very relaxing. And it's got all these salts in it and you basically float yeah. in the pool. And it was a couple's pool. So the two of us could go in there and, um, you know, and, and the whole purpose of that, he took me there, you know, it'd be great. You'll be able to relax and just switch off and not be able to, you know, have the the constant thinking and planning and, you know, all the things that, well, I tend to do on the regular because that's just kind of has been the way, I'm going to say not the way I am, but the way I've programmed myself to be over time, right? I get into this room and we're both in there and he's having this lovely old time, just relaxed laying there and I'm and I'm good with that for about five minutes I lay for five minutes might have been 20 I might I might have been doing myself a bit of an injustice by saying it was five minutes laying there for 20 minutes nice and relaxed until it starts you know and you're thinking about you know what's going on and what do I have to do and um you know what didn't go well and what should I be thinking instead and all of these things next minute um he would say that he was almost in a uh, whirlpool and uh, not that not a nice relaxing pool because oh. instead of Tracy laying there nice and relaxed oh no I'm pushing off the sides thinking oh this is really cool you know having a whole lot of fun in this pool when he's trying to relax so one of the things uh, so so why I've brought that particular story out because so I'm sure I'm not the only person in this world who finds it really hard to relax and then taking that time, because I know you do a lot of work in terms of mm. meditation and just mm. being able to relax and take that time to get a little bit introspective. Mm. How does one do that and start doing it on the regular? Because I know a lot of the stuff that we experience mm. as business owners can often be resolved when we just give ourselves a little bit of shush and quiet. Exactly. So first up, I want to find out where that bath is because I live an hour down the road from you, so I'm going... There's loads of them everywhere. Okay. You'd lo I mean, it is lovely. You'll, you'll just mm -hmm. after the program, we can have a chat. I'm like, oh, that sounds really cool. So uh, thank you for letting me know about that. As for what to do with that, actually, I'll lead you through a very simple technique to, and I did it in the in just before we came on air, and just because mm -hmm. I was feeling really nervous. Um, so we'll do it together, and if any of your listeners want to do it, uh, yeah. that's all good too. So uh, it's a very short breathing technique, and uh, first we just breathe in for the count of four, hold for two, and then breathe out for the count of six. This is very short, but I don't know, 10 seconds, not, not long at all. So just breathe in for the count of four, hold for two, out for six. Do that again. Hold for two, out for six, in for four, Hold for two, out for six. How are you feeling? How's your little mind chatter? Oh, yeah, there wasn't any. I was too, too busy concentrating on breathing in for, for four, holding for two and breathing out for six. You know what I mean? Your focus is in a different place. So how does your body feel now? How does your mind feel? Relaxed. Okay. How long did that take? Yeah, about less than 30 seconds. Right. There you go. Mm -hmm. So next mm -hmm. time you can do this before you go into a meeting. You can do that before, like I did that before on coming on air. You can do that when you're in the um, the bathtub, uh, the the pool yeah. thing with your your partner. You can do it anywhere. It's I find it really really helpful, and it also if you're awake at night, it's really nice to do that when you're sort of like kind of going awake, you know. 
and the, mm. the mind is kind of really, it's quite difficult, so it's hard to sustain because it takes such a lot of effort, you know, to, to maintain um, an, a mind that's on track like that, so really keeping that. And as for how to have a meditation practice, it is really good. There's a few different very simple techniques that take almost no time that are just uh, ways to just slow down for a quick sec. So one of them is what are, it's called uh, leave no trace. And that mm -hmm. is when you uh, you get your cup of tea, you, you might have a dishwasher, but if you don't have a dishwasher like me, then instead of putting it down on the counter, you wash it up, you get the tea towel, you dry it, you put it in the cupboard. So you finish it. And it sound, and it's like then you haven't got anything later. And it sounds like, well, that's not really a meditation practice, but it is it. It is a way of just slowing down so that it you finish something and then you don't you aren't left with a pile of dishes apart from anything else. So likewise, when you uh, go to the bathroom, you wash your hands afterwards, you get the the cloth and you wipe out the sink and then it's just slows down for a minute and then become aware of what is the attitude you're bringing to that? Is it that, oh, I should be finished this and can we get hurry up with this or I don't have time mm -hmm. for this or, um, oh, this reminds me of, you know, so-and-so who always wanted me to have a really clean house and I really hate this. Mm -hmm. And that whatever it is that's going on for you, it doesn't matter what it is just to notice it. So that's mm. the, some, another one that's really good. Uh, another one is when you're walking. So if you've got to go um, just, you know, down to the bus stop or the train station or somewhere like that, just to see how well you're connecting to the ground. And I mostly are supposed to sort of uh, feel the sensations on the ground, but all of us wear shoes. So I find it easier to notice the movements of the ankles and that's just to bring the conversation out of the head and then down into the feet so that it stops being so worry. Another one to try is um, when you're driving in your car or walking along or uh, whatever it is, start to think about anything pleasant. So if it's a lovely day, not too hot, not too cold, it might be the feel of sun on your back and just how lovely that is. Mm -hmm. Equally, it might be that someone, um, so if you go back 24 hours to this time yesterday and just kind of think, well, what was I doing yesterday? Oh, well, so-and-so did that and I I was, oh, yeah, that, that, that was actually really lovely because they did this kind thing for me and somebody said a kind gesture, it, you know, something kind to you or perhaps your cat came up and just you know like said hello mm -hmm. or it doesn't it doesn't matter how small it is super tiny is better and just go through the day and think of how many pleasant experiences you have not to get caught up into the whole grateful thing I'm a bit funny about the gratefulness movement because I think it can be a bit more doing instead mm -hmm. all we're noticing here is um, how well are we receiving what is there so yeah so uh, that's I'm, that one and then i've got yeah. one more one more meditation oh. thing yeah mm -hmm. which is when you get into bed at night just uh set your timer for on on airplane mode sit there for 60 seconds and then just notice your body breathe that's what or you can do that breath counting that i did before or think about pleasant thoughts whatever it is and then after about one week try two minutes and then after another week, three minutes. And it sounds like it's nothing, but uh, actually I've got clients who have who have been sitting at four or five minutes for about three weeks. And I, if they don't go really slowly, then they kind of don't have time and I don't I'm not going to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's that. Sorry, I cut you off. Mm -hmm. No, I was just going to say, you know, as you're talking through uh, these techniques, it's apparent that it's really, or it seems that, you're really, you know, narrowing down your focus and you're bringing that focus into the present moment, apart from when we're thinking about, you know, a particular situation or a time or the yesterday and, and trying to remember those feelings at that time. But in the main, it's thinking about, you know, being present, being, um, you know, 
grateful, if I can use that word, you know, grateful that we're actually here and able to have a conversation like this, that I've met somebody new, that, you know, all of the things that are uh, positive and lovely about whatever's going on with you at that time and just allowing yourself to be present in that moment. That's exactly right. So when we started off the conversation, we started about the perils of positive thinking. And mm. if you're having to, to, if you're having a really terrible time, like you would have had after your mother died, you know, where are you? Actually, you're really just sad. And so to, you, mm. if you kind of do the positive thinking thing, that's not where you are. Yeah. Mm hmm so that's all it is. It's here we are is where we are. We don't have two times. We don't have the should time. We just have this time. There is no other time. Yeah. And, and allowing yourself, well, acknowledging what's going on with yourself at that time. You know, what I find quite interesting is that often we talk about, um, you know, if I can talk about the positive self-talk or positive positive thinking that then turns into, you know, positive verbalization of something. And yeah. and often we are very, very kind to others. Yeah. But sometimes not always kind to ourselves. And I was I was watching something the other day and he said, um, you know, the number of times that I've actually stopped and thought about the things that I've said to myself, you know, like, oh, you silly person, or why did you do that? Or um, you shouldn't have done that. Or, God, you're a dipstick. Or what, whatever the things are that, you know, you, you tell yourself often when things don't go right. And they said, you know, if you actually use those words with your best friend, would they be your best friend for very long? And, you know, it was like, well, heck no, they wouldn't be. Um, so this, this concept of, speaking or create or treating ourselves as our own best friends and being focused and aware and kind to ourselves first what are your thoughts on 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 that and and how you know one can can adopt that into their lives yeah so it's interesting i you know people do say that and I, there is definitely truth. Like I wouldn't verbalize to another person what I think, what I, mm. what I kind of might it could be a little treat. scary, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't want to do that. But I actually don't think that we are kinder to others than we are to ourselves. In often, I've had some situations. I've just moved up to Queensland, mm -hmm. and I've had some situations where I've, I've kind of tried to buy things on Gumtree which is like Craigslist and I've had these replies back and one person basically said I was a crazy lady and another person said you're a pain so I bet that those people would I mean it wasn't wow. a direct quote but it wasn't far from it and I think that uh when we when we talk to ourselves in uh, in unkind ways we actually talk about others in unkind ways it, it's a bit like you were saying before if you're disappointed or whatever it is you know it mm -hmm. seeps out mm -hmm. um, so it's because it's not we're not in check with it but the judgment that drives that conversation is kind of a judgment that's sitting there ready to be pounced on somewhere else. So for instance uh, so if you give me an instance where you talked and negatively about yourself maybe you're a bit disappointed with something that happened so maybe it was about that incident where you're talking about with your husband um i'm just trying to think uh, you know of a particular situation and and it's not necessarily you know it's just that when you do something for example and i can't think of something in particular but um you know, you might say, oh, why did you do that, silly person? You know, what did, what did you do it like that for? Uh, and I was actually speaking with uh, one of my um, one of my team members the other day and it was, uh, what were we talking about? It was, oh, it was to do with an application that we were working on. And uh, I went back and said, oh, I'm sorry. It was probably, you know, I probably did something wrong there. Um, sorry about that. And she said, you know, it's really interesting because a lot of the time, male and female um, type situation she'd say you know the male would blame it on the 
the application, whereas, you know, you as a female will often say, hey, the blame is on me. I took, mm. uh, you know, I'll take that on board and and I've obviously done something wrong. And so therefore we were like, darn, silly me. Um, why did I do it that way? So not necessarily, you know, and maybe there is, I would say there's a degree of, of um, negative self-talk, you know, oh, darn, silly me. You know, it's maybe not so... Um, as an acknowledgement, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I should have done that a little bit differently. But with that, that uh, negative connotation that goes with it, you know how how damaging that can be. It, it certainly. I mean, you know, like I one time I did. I mean, I'm not saying that I don't have negative self talk, you know, but I also noticed that I can be very critical of others. So I'm. That, I guess that's kind of what I'm alluding to. And one time, I just yeah. thought I'll listen to it. And for some reason, it was like up at volume 10 and I heard it and I was just like, wow, that is one hell of a cop, excuse my language, just an enormous kind of full on horrible assassination, character assassination. And it went on for about, I just thought I'm not going to interfere with it. I'll let it go. Mm -hmm. And it it took about three days for for the volume to go down. And now when I, of course, I hear negative self-talk, I just go, oh, yeah, that's negative self-talk. I'm not afraid of it anymore in the same way. Uh, yeah, I think that I think there can be some gender differences. I do think that um, it sounds like I think there's something, I think it's really nice to take responsibility when we've made mistakes. So I just want to mm. speak to that part of you that said, oh, I'm sorry, I think I made a mistake there. I think it's really important to register when we make a mistake and um, and, and and in that way. Because uh, otherwise, how can you learn? Because if you don't register yeah. how many of your own mistakes, then, well, everybody else is the problem and then where are you? Um, but then inner self-talk, I think that it really shows uh, something about not being resourced enough in yourself so Mm. it's sort of skimming over the top and it's not really it for me what I found is that that inner critic talk arises uh, when I feel disappointed in something I've done so I haven't come Mm. up to the mark in some ways for me it has a very strong flavor of disappointment um, but you asked something else in there, and I've just suddenly gone blank, so I'm so sorry. You asked something about, oh, I've, I'm so sorry, I've just suddenly gone blank on your question. It would be like, um, I suppose, well, the next question I've got for you then would be, if somebody is having, like as a business owner, right, and we bring yeah. maybe some of these unresolved things to us to our working environment, what sort of things do they show up as? What sort of things would you sort of, have you observed Okay. seeing these things sort of bubble up? Okay. So one of the things, uh, negative self-talk comes out. So there are, I know what I was going to say. So there are basically three different mm, characters. Most people fit within one of these three. And there are the people who tend to be socially dominant. So I would fit in that category and uh, tend to be quite critical. And uh, the form of critical takes on an an angry style. So I tend to be what they call moving against. So Karen Horne I talks about um, a moving against character, rub people up the wrong way, be forthright, very strident. Then you've got people who move away and they're people who tend to be um, disengaged, they're sort of wanting to downregulate the body sensations. They talk about everything is in balance. So that's that. Mm-hmm. And there's another one which is um, pe- uh, tends to be uh, self-defeating and it puts themselves under. So if I sort of say that I put myself above in the social dominant situation, they would mm-hmm. put themselves below and they do everything for everybody else, taking care of themselves last. So often those people have like three jobs and ten. I met a woman at uni and she had two full-time jobs plus a full study, study load. Plus she was caring for two autistic children and an elderly grandmother. It's it's not much of an exaggeration. Like the body can only be available for a certain amount. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, of course, she was living on junk food and, of course, her body's going to conk out. You know, there's no choice about that. 
my my observation with those people who always put everybody else first is that there's a conversation about how people aren't dedicated enough. Mm. So they aren't working hard enough. You know, I'm working really hard. So there's this real resentful tone that kind of starts, mm. starts to seep in. And it, that's just the, that person hasn't got good work-life balance. So I would say in that one. The inner critic in terms of uh, the social dominant one, it, it tends to be more blamey. So they should have done this and they should have done that and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, the sort of more um, moving away one will just try and down-regulate anything. So just kind of try and um, it's, a, it's a little bit blamey but not nearly as harsh. So there's quite a lot of harshness in the first one. In that, in that moving against type like I have. Um, and the other one will tend to be more uh, maybe a bit dismissive, oh, they didn't really mean it or something down that end, not, not mm -hmm. fully engaged with the, the issue at hand. Mm -hmm. And so when, when a business owner, you know, identifies themselves in one of these three different areas and they recognize that what are some of the the um i suppose leadership ramifications or things that they may may find are not such good outcomes because they have these i'm going to call them traits um maybe that are, are not acknowledged that they haven't actually acknowledged them yeah well i mean it's just basically acting out isn't it so you know, people are unhappy, they're unproductive. So one of my clients, he was like, you know, they're not dedicated enough. And um, he's like that. But his co-founder is somebody who is more of my style, very abrupt, aggressive, doesn't, hasn't kept, hasn't learned about that. He, he probably has a narcissistic personality and he gets very blamey. And so there's a senior manager in his company um, and the work starts to get really sloppy. It starts to, um, he's a bit demotivated, he's not there, um, he's not putting in the sort of uh, full, you know, he's not engaged, you know, he's, he's mm -hmm. feeling disengaged. So when people aren't um, moving away, resigning, all that sort of stuff, that's pretty clear. I mean, when you, when you think about people you like to hang out with, what are the qualities that you like in a leader? Uh, yeah, do you want me to answer that as a question? Yep. Ah, yep. okay. Somebody who's engaged, somebody who is um, present when you're actually talking to them, somebody yep. who cares about the company, somebody who can lead by example, who's prepared yep. to do what, what they're asking me to do. So those would be yep. some of the things that's just for me personally, um, what I like to see in a, you know, in somebody that's either working with me or is has been my superior in the past and supportive, who's interested in, who's actually interested in you as a person. Yeah, so they might ask questions, you know, how did you mm -hmm. arrive at that? So so there's basically four questions. Well, the, I'll give you some five conversation kind of hints, which I mm. basically sums up, if you can do this, this is all you need to do in terms of your questioning sk skills, your conversational skills. So somebody comes to you with a problem and I haven't done this or something like that, then the, you might say, I failed to do that. So you said that the other day, oh, you know, you, on your app, it didn't quite come together. I'm sorry, I made a mistake on that. And then the first question to ask is, tell me more about um, the problem that, that's going on. So just start with, tell me more about mm. that. The second one is to uh, ask any questions that begin with what or how. Any other syntax, question syntax that begins with do, is, are, would you say, do you think, um, why, skip all those questions. They're really, really mm. bad ways to frame a question just because if I say why did you do that, it's got a real accusatory so tone to it. If yes. I say, would you say or do you think, then um, then that's actually me. That's about what I want. That's More not leading. About what you want. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and is it is it this or is it that? It's too narrow. You're not getting enough answer. Mm -hmm. It's a closed question. So if you ask what, 
what happened with that what were the circumstances that arose with that what was the context that made you understand that what was going on for you in your in your world that 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 decision was made that's one or how how did you arrive at that conclusion what were you uh, how did you understand that what was the correct you know how did you understand mm -hmm. the action or the need and then the last one is uh it's a slightly different thing and it's to say so so say you've said um you i've got this problem with my it at this app and i'm sorry i made a mistake on that and you go oh look um i'm sorry about that it was a bit of a um an issue and you've talked and you've gone um something like i I, I made a mistake with A, B, C, D, E, F. And you might mm -hmm. say something like, uh, I was just really busy and I, and I feel like I've made a big mistake or something like that. And then you can say something like, uh, what I hear you care about. So this, this is mm -hmm. the sentence that's really useful. What I hear you care about is that it has to be right every time, that you don't make mistakes yeah, that's really true. It is really important that it's a really high standard. And, or I, I really hear that you you want a high standard here. Yeah, so that's that. And then it stops being a punitive adversarial conversation. It starts to really open up and it's like, then when somebody feels like in that instance, I want really high quality work. Yeah, so... Then you can ask more questions. Well, what are the what's the, what are the circumstances or situations mm. that work for you to ensure that your work is high quality? Is it that you're not drinking two liters of water a day because that's the best way to keep your spirits up? Drinking two liters of water a day. Uh, is it that you're um, too busy, distracted, this, that, and all the rest? So that's whatever it is. You you've then got opportunities to work together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm. Someone's saying here that and then it sounds more like a conversation rather than it being, I'm going to give you some feedback or, you know, and, and often when we think of it like that, you know, as a conversation rather than I'm going to give you some feedback or in a lot of cases, I'm going to give you some coaching on that. You know, the person comes at it from a point of view of, okay, we're going to have a chat about it. And I'm actually going to, it's an, it's from a, a a perspective of improvement rather than trying to find uh, the the negative or the things that I've done wrong in a particular situation. So I, I really like that. It's interesting. Um, my husband's an investigator. So a lot of these things that, you know, you're you're talking about here, you know, classic investigative, uh, you know, conversation um, starters to be able to really uncover what's you know what's going on and what what's what's happening in this particular situation and getting to the bottom of something rather than it just being very superficial yeah and i and i just wanted to put in something there so with the feedback and um coaching kind of thing that's mm -hmm. really those that perspective is you've got one or above the other so it's sort of like mm. a parent child kind of lack of better word that kind of dynamic and I think that can be too often manifesting in a workplace that people the boss somehow thinks that they're not talking to a grown-up adult with a whole lot of experience mm -hmm. uh, but if you come through as a conversation tell me more about what's going on for that that sense of excuse me sorry about that um that sense of not being an equal that sense of being an equal really allows well we're both humans here how can we get the outcome we want so yeah that's great that uh, i didn't know that that's what investigators do but well, yeah, they absolutely do i hear them talking about these questions all the time and they often will use them um obviously in, at home too so anyway you know those sorts of things definitely are um a great ways of being able to create a an equal and a level conversation so you're both on you know the same level on the same page um so to speak in terms of like taking some of these things because we've kind of gone full circle with this right it's like we started off talking about you know positive thinking and often we're so um brought up to to think so positively and see the silver lining and everything and wear your rose-colored glasses and we've talked about how uh, you know how often that can i'm going to say um, 
almost steals away from you the ability to be able to really feel and be in the moment. Um, and so that that's one of the, I see as the biggest peril of, of that kind of positive thinking, positive thinking all the time. It's not allowing yourself or dismissing what you really, really feel. And then talking about how do we, you know, how do we often see this manifest or show itself in various different situations, whether it be, you know, a personal situation or a, or a business situation, and then being able to take that and maybe use the tools that you teach around meditation to bring us back to the present moment, to acknowledge and think about where we are at that time and be kind to ourselves and give us that, I'm going to say, give us the, the time and the white space white space, I want to call it, to to feel that uh, and, and gift ourselves, um, you know, that, that level of presence. With wrapping up today, who would be the best kind, like for you to be able to help people with this and be able to enable them to become, you know, practice the art of being introspective, what are the what are some of the major benefits you would see from uh, from somebody who would want to go down the path of working with you to to adopt some of these practices into their life? What sort of person would would be best suited to working with you, and what sort of outcomes could they expect to see if they adopt these practices? Thank you. Um, so people who actually want to learn who they are and how they are, what their mind is. Um, I don't work with people who want to control the situation. So I had a client and he just wanted to have a still mind and he had a very strong uh, martial arts background. And so he wanted to just have the still mind. He wanted that. And I, it, that's not really the way that I work. So I can't, I don't work well with people if they're looking for a particular state of mind, I would say. I work mm -hmm. well with people who are curious about what is really going on for them uh, and who want to shift something. So I have a client and he came to me because he was having, he was crashing and burning all his relationships because he was really, really, ang he was really angry all the time. So he would like, totally he he realized that he had crashed his his career in many instances because although he's a brilliant guy he was completely offensive often so mm -hmm. he's really motivated to think well i i don't want to crash i've started my own company i don't want to crash my relationships that's not going to go well so he's recognized that i work well with people who um who uh, I work with somebody else and he he works na he he was working for for a company and then he went off and tried to start his own company it took a lot it was a lot more work than he thought and he wasn't nearly prepared enough to leave the company that he so he ended up going back into contracting but what he learned along the way was really useful for that process and so he was really open to understanding what it means to be a leader. And basically, you can't be a leader unless you uh, harness the norms and values of the followers. So you have to embody mm -hmm. what it is that, that that is. So if you are willing to be open to how you can do things differently, not by sort of skimming over the surface, but actually start to go, I'm going to put myself in a slightly uncomfortable situation um, just to test what it's like to inquire what's going on for me. I'm curious to see how this would be. Maybe it'll be horrible and then I've learnt that. But maybe I'll grow and I'll do something. So though anybody really who is interested in learning about how to experience life very differently um, from the inside out. So I'm mm -hmm. not very good with people who are, they. it's all about the outcomes and, and that sort of thing. What happens is when you change at the inside, 
by nature, you change the outside. Mm -hmm. So the outcomes are that people are less angry. Um, they um, start to see they have real options. So uh, the client I was talking with yesterday, she was talking about she started to get really blamey with somebody. And then she realized that actually this was an opportunity that she had lost to say, I don't need to blame that person. There's something here in me that is the problem. It's not them. It's me. And then you go, ah, then she's like now able to see that she has options. So instead of just going yeah. down the old route of just being, you know, attacking, she's really internalising that she has some agency in how she wants to navigate her relationships. So that's what I would say. Beautiful. Well, I want to let everybody know because there will be um, some people that are listening today that really resonate with what uh, Wendy's talking about or what we've shared today and that you want to explore and you want to take the conversation further. So I'm going to let you guys know where you can go to get more of Wendy. And I absolutely love this. Maybe had a, a little bit of a giggle today, but uh, her website, kindlycutthecrap.com. You can head on over there. There is an option for you to be able to book in a discovery call with Wendy. And I would encourage you to do that, have a bit of a chat with her. You can then explore whether or not you know, working together is the right thing for you to do. But if you're experiencing any of these things, you want to find, I'm going to say, some inner peace, some get to know yourself better from the inside out and maybe change or, you know, change ex uh, internally and externally, uh, then Wendy would be the right person for you to, to have a chat with. I want to say thank you so much for being here today. It's been an absolutely lovely conversation. Uh, I appreciate your ability to be able to get people People in the present moment and acknowledging all you know firstly starting off with an acknowledgement to country I absolutely love that and then acknowledging and you know being uh, so mindful of of what I've you know of what what's been going on um, in the last little while and then just adding in a few little bits and pieces of picking up maybe on some of the things that are uh, have been happening and using those as examples for everybody else to use so thank you very very much for that Thank you. It's been lovely. I've really enjoyed the chat and thank you not for uh, thank you for not being too scary. I did have one interview where I was very scared. So I really appreciate that. Hopefully not that's not me, not scary. No, not at all. So I've really enjoyed it. I hope you've you've found something useful in that. Not everybody finds it useful. Um, but if there's something useful, that's great. If it's not, well, have a have a it's been lovely to, to be here. So Absolutely. You. I think the segment, uh, and this is also for our viewers too, you guys know I love to do this, but there's always some gems that come out of every single show. And I think if you go back to the middle part of the show where Wendy was actually taking us through uh, a particular, or taking me through some particular breathing exercises, I think if you just if it's just that one thing, you know, in those moments where you're feeling a little bit anxious, overwhelmed or what, whatever the situation is and you just need to take a moment, you know, use those breathing techniques just to bring you back to the present, uh, present moment and allow yourself some time to prepare for the next thing. So go forth, enjoy. And as I always say on the Unlocked Show, go to go and live your life unlocked because there's just no other way. Thanks so much for joining us, Wendy. I'll be back again, guys. Friday is another day that you will see me live on the Unlocked Show, 10 a.m. Brisbane time. And then again next week, we've got some amazing guests uh, booked on the show. In fact, we are booked currently out to about September, October. I had a look at the schedule today. Um, so we've got some really cool guests coming up. Um, just like Wendy and the other guests that we've had on the Unlock Show. But make sure you take what we talk about and you implement them into your life because that's really, truly the only way that you make uh, any change or any transformation happen. Uh, if you just do it once or twice, you know, it might be fun for that moment, but it's not really going to be, you know, it's not going to stick around. So thanks for, very much for joining us. Hope you guys are all having a wonderful week and I'll see you guys again on Friday. Thanks, Spin. Thanks, and uh, see you then. Bye for now. Bye.